I'm going to start off with a little health, health nugget. We all, all of us, are pretty familiar with the eight laws of health. Well, this time of year, not only this time of year, I see things going on. The last eight laws of uh, last one is trust in God. A lot of people have a hard time trusting in God or don't believe in Him or trust Him at all. But you know, the Bible speaks specifically about trusting in God. And Nahum 1 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Psalms 118.8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In these last days of earth's history, or even in our last days on this earth, we need to trust in God. Not in politics, not in man, but only in trust in God. When we trust in God and his leading, we will have good health. We all want good health, right? We won't be discouraged or depressed. Depression causes a lot of health problems and discouragement. You're healthy when you trust in God for all your daily needs. Let's pray before we begin the message. Our Father God in heaven, may we always trust in you. Lord, guide our thoughts and our words and our actions. Lord, bless us. And may this message resonate with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. In the days of the rending of the, of the kingdom during... Um, Hezekiah and Jeroboam's time. A century before when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, in bold defiance of God, whom Israel had served, was endeavoring to turn the hearts of the people away from services in, of the temple, the sanctuary, in Jerusalem, to, listen to this, new forms of worship. He had set up an unconsecrated altar to Bethel, during the dedication of the, this altar, where many, where many in years to come were to be seduced into idolatrous practices, there had suddenly appeared a man of God from Judea. With words of condemnation for the sacrilegious proceedings, he had cried against the altar, declaring, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born, unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt, burnt upon thee. If you go to 2 Kings 21, we're not going to read all this, but 2 Kings 21, 22, and 23 begin and talk about and discuss the coming up, 21 coming up to Josiah, and that the servants killed Josiah's father, and then the people of the nation of Judea killed the servants. And Josiah was eight years old at this time. Think about that. Josiah was being raised by the priests. Ten years later, when he was 18, Josiah asked to go tribute and pay you know, the money to take care of those who were taking care of the temple. And then there was a book found. They found the book, the law, the book of Deuteronomy, and brought it and read it to Josiah, and he rent his garment. Because of what the law said. And this book, Deuteronomy, is the fifth book of the Torah. And the book, of, it says, Ellen White says that the book of Deuteronomy should be carefully studied by those living on the earth today. Have you studied and read the book of Deuteronomy lately? 
There's some pretty powerful stuff in there. It contains a record of the instruction given to Moses to give to the children of Israel. In it, the law is repeated. The law of God was also to be repeated to Israel that its precepts might not be forgotten. It was to be kept before the people and was ever to be exalted and honored. Parents were to read the law to their children, teach it to them line upon line, precept upon precept. And on public occasions, the law was to be read in the hearing of all the people. Upon obedience to this law depended the prosperity, you hear that, the prosperity of Israel. We are modern Israel. We're to have the prosperity that God wants us to have. We need to be obedient to the laws and the precepts. If they were obedient, it would bring them life. If disobedient, death. As the king read the, read the prophecies of swift judgment upon those who should persist in rebellion, he trembled for the future. The perversity of Judah had been great. What was to be the outcome of their continued apostasy? And if you go back, I'm not going to read it all and study it. I urge you to go back and read the book of Josiah. I mean, read the book of uh, 2 Kings 22 and follow Josiah. There were a lot of wicked kings, but at this time, Judah and Israel, uh, Jerusalem, Israel had separated. It was prophesied back, prophesied in the back during Solomon that they would, that there would be a separation. Judah, tribe of Judah, with Benjamin went to the south, and the other ten tribes went to the north. Um, what is the outcome of our apostasy? Something to think about. When Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and I read this earlier, and, and bold defiance of God whom Israel had served, was endeavoring to turn the hearts of people away from the service of the temple in Jerusalem to new forms of worship. Think about that. The title of the sermon is Progressive Christianity. There's a movement been going on for quite some time, but it's even getting more subtle. Satan knows that Jesus is coming very soon. And I'm going to turn to Jude, the book of Jude. Read the first four verses. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So Jude was a brother of James. To those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Didn't Christ warn us about that in Matthew 24? There would be wolves in sheep clothes. There would be false Christs, Right? For certain men, verse 4, have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the Holy Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There are five dangerous signs to watch out for in our church. I'm going to read these, and I'm going to go back. Four signs in a progressive Christianity. There is a lowered view of the Bible. Um, feelings are emphasized over facts. Um, where is that? Number three, essential Christian doctrines are open for reinterpretation. Number four, historic terms are redefined. Number five, the heart of the gospel message shifts from sin and redemption to social justice. This isn't just happening within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's happening within the whole Christian world. And there's, there's the Methodist Church just had a big split. There was 200 and I believe about 84 churches that left the Methodist denomination because of, of progressive Christianity, progressive things that are happening within the church and letting things. So let me go through and explain some of these. 
One of the main differences between progressive Christianity and historic Christianity is its view of the Bible historically. Christians have viewed the Bible as the word of God and authoritative for our lives. Progressive Christianity generally abandons these terms, emphasizing personal belief over the biblical mandate, like the divinity of Christ, saying he was created. Number two, like literal day of literal days of creation, or the Godhead, saying that the Holy Spirit is not God. These are all progressive things that come into the church. Putting his role as equal with man, that is not biblical. Not calling sin by its right name. Some of the comments that are related to this are the Bible is a human book. Is the Bible a human book? No. 2 Timothy 3.16 was our scripture reading. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's not a human book. It's written by, it, it is the word of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Another thing that they say is they disagree with the Apostle Paul on certain issues, on that issue of, of the Bible. But Acts 9, uh, 16, 9, 9 verse 6, Acts 9 verse 6, I'm going to give some Bible texts here, which we should be familiar with to refute some of these claims that are happening, that are very subtle happening within the progressive Christianity and church. It says, um, Acts 9, says, So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then he, the Lord said to them, Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul. Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he was seeing a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. So, and there, here he was, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel. In the progressive church, they say they, don't, they disagree with the Apostle Paul on issues. But he was chosen. It says right here that Paul was a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So right there, there is proof that Paul was a chosen vessel. We can't disagree with what he says. You may want to disagree, but it, it, he was chosen by God to carry the message, right? Another uh, thing you might hear is that the Bible condones immorality, so we are obligated to reject what it says in certain places. Let's go to Galatians 5, verse 16. What they say is that the Bible condones immortality, immorality. Galatians 5, verse 16 says, And I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fill the lust of the flesh. So they, they condone immorality, but the Bible says, No, walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not on the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, con contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, and which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So that goes against what they say. They're saying that the Bible condones immorality, but 
My Bible says it doesn't condone immorality. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in Spirit. Let us not be con become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The Bible contains the Word of God. It is one of the things they say. It doesn't just contain the Word of God. It is the Word of God. So very subtle. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Psalms 119, 105 says, the word, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Number two on the progressive church or the progressive um, Christianity is feelings are emphasized over facts. In progressive churches, personal experiences, feelings and opinions tend to be valued over objective truth. As the Bible ceases to be viewed as God's definitive word, what a person feels to be true becomes the ultimate authority for faith and practice. So, the, what they say also is that the Bible verse doesn't resonate with me. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Boy, that resonates with me. Piercing even the dividing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen? Another thing they say is they say, I thought homosexuality was a sin until I met and befriended some gay people. Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as, one, as with womankind. It is abomination. And then last week the pastor hit on this. I'm going to bring it back out. Romans 1. He was preaching on Romans 1 if you were here or listening online. Um, but Romans 1, 18 also brings this out. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the be things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Profession to be, professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed four animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creation rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the na natural use of the woman burned in their lusts for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a de debased mind to do these things which are not fitting. And you go down to verse 32, it says that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Not only if they do them, but they also approve if you approve of those practices, you are, you are subject to death. One other thing they say is, I just can't believe Jesus would send God people, good people to hell. How many times have you heard that? You know, why does God do this to good people? Well, it isn't God that does it. We understand that. There is sin in this world. Psalms 9, God, you know, God is a fair God and a just God. Psalms 9, 1, 9, 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell 
and all the nations that forget God. Revelation 20, verse 11 says, And I saw a great white, th white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So does that say that good people are put, to, put in hell? No. The Bible specifically is very true to what it says. It says that if you go against God and go against his commandments and don't repent of your sins, that's where you'll end up. But if you follow God, you will have eternal life, right? Revelation 22, 11 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. All right, the third point on the progressive church is essential Christian doctrines are open for reinterpretation. Very dangerous. There, there um, was an author that wrote this as tr uh, wrote on progressive Christianity. He says tradition, dogma, and doctrine are all for fair game because all pass through the hands of flawed humanity. Progressive Christians are often open to redefining and reinterpreting the Bible on hot button moral issues like homosexuality and abortion, and also cardinal doctrines such as a virgin conception and the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the only and the resurrection of Jesus. So, let's hit on this. Um, I'll go back to 2 Timothy 3, 6, 16, because it says, one of the things they say is the resurrection of Jesus doesn't have to be factual to speak truth. But it says that all scripture is given by inspiration, right? And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The church's historic position of sexuality is our on sexuality is archaic and needs to be updated with a modern framework. That's what they believe. The Bible says it is written that man shall not live by the bread alone, but by every word of God. The whole LGBT trend is viewed in the world as a different sin. If you murder or you steal, commit adultery, it's dealt with even in the public sector on courts. But with the LGBT view, it is praised, it is paraded, it is thrown in our faces and paired up with equal rights. It is not looked upon as a sin. God is very plain about the sin of men with men, sin with men and women, uh, with men with men and women with women. It is a sin and will have the same punishment as other sins unconfessed. The idea of literal hell, this is what they also say, is offensive to non-Christians and needs to be reinterpreted. God is very plain in the, in the Word of God. In Revelation 20, which we, we read, he talks about who goes where, the non-Christians and, and the Christians, those who are, didn't repent. Fourth point that they say, historic, historic terms are redefined. We saw this in the public sister, sector. They want to take away all the history. Well, they want to do it also in the Bible. They want to take away the history in the Bible. We learn whether it was good or bad. We learn from the history. There are some progressive Christians who say they affirm doctrines like biblical inspiration, 
inerrancy and authority, but they have to do linguistic gymnastics to make those words mean what they want them to mean. A question was asked, do you believe the, to a pastor, do you believe the Bible is divinely inspired? He answered confidently, yes, of course. However, I mistakenly assume that when using the word inspired, they both meant the same thing. He, he clarified months later what he meant. This is what he said, that the Bible is inspired in the same way and on the same level as many other Christian books, songs, and sermons. This, of course, is not how Christians have historically understood, understood the doctrine of divine inspiration. Another word that tends to get a progressive makeover is the word love. When plucked out of its biblical context, it becomes a catch-all term for everything non-confrontative, pleasant, and affirming. One of the things they say is that God wouldn't punish sinners. He is love. Well, if I go to Deuteronomy 4.24, it says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Another point they say is, say, sure, the Bible is authoritative, but we've misunderstood it for, first, for the first 2,000 years of church history. And it says that they also say it is not our job to talk to anyone about sin. It is our job just to love them. Well, if I go to the Bible, didn't Jonah go to Nineveh to warn them of their sin? So if we go by the Bible, we are to help others who are sinning. James 5.19 says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. So we're, we're to go to our brothers and sisters. Put our arm around them. And in love, show them where they are erring. Point number five, the heart of the gospel message shifts from, sin, shifts from sin and redemption to social justice. There is no doubt that the Bible commands us to take care of the unfortunate and defend those who are oppressed. This is a very real and profoundly important part of what it means to live out our Christian faith. However, the core message of Christianity, the gospel, is that Jesus died for our sins was buried and resurrected, and thereby reconciled us to God. This is the message that will truly bring freedom to the oppressed. Many progressive Christians, they find the concept of God willing his son to die on the cross to be embarrassing or even appalling, sometimes preferred to as cosmic child abuse. The idea of blood atonement is de-emphasized or denied altogether with social justice and good works enthroned in its place. My Bible tells me different. We have the sanctuary message, we have the atonement of the blood, and why the atonement of the blood, it carries the oxygen, it carries the life, right? One of their comments, they say, sin doesn't separate us from God, we are made in his image, and he calls us good. Hebrews 7.26 tells me, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. God was with Adam and Eve physically every day, face to face, and because of sin, they weren't allowed to be in his presence. So they're saying that sin doesn't separate us from God, but sin truly separates us from God, right? And when sin is ratified and God comes and takes us, he will be with us. He tells us plainly in Revelation that he is longing and waiting to be with us face to face, right? God didn't, this is one of the things I say, God didn't actually require a sacrifice for his sins. The first Christians picked up on the pagan practice of animal sacrifice and told the Jesus story in similar terms. I'll go back. The sanctuary service was given as a type pointing to Christ's sacrifice. One of the points they bring out, we don't really need to preach the gospel, we just need to show love by bringing justice to the oppressed and provision to the needy. Well, my Bible says otherwise. Acts 10, 37 says, That word I say ye know which was published throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing 
all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Now to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before our God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he, God, Jesus, commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So we are told by the scripture that we are to preach the gospel unto the people. They say we not supposed to, we don't need to. Another point they bring out says, according to the word of God, this new, well, no, this, I'm sorry. According to the word of God, this new form of worship, worship that, that was, Jeroboam was put, pointed out started with Cain. When God said, offer me a sacrifice, he gave a tainted sacrifice. That was a new form of worship that started with Cain. I was thinking about it. I said, man, you read about it and all these idols and all that, you know, Solomon. We read about it in Sabbath school class. And King Solomon, he even became infeminate. He put all these idols up because he mingled and married and went against what God said. But if you think about it, you go all the way back to Cain when he gave the wrong, worship God in the wrong way, it went against what God said. And then it, 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 it kept going on and on and on, even into the, today, that people are trying to form a new form of worship, taking away the hymnals, putting in different music, putting in all different things within the churches that Satan is just really putting his wedge in. The very foundation of our faith is being watered down and torn down. Luke 17, 26 says, And it was in the days of Noah, so shall also be in the days of Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It is God that shields his creatures and hinges them, hedges them in from the power of, of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protective care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Isaiah 24, verse 4 says, The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. Remember, our scripture reading, all scripture, not some, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Remember also what Psalmist said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Are we going to be like King Josiah? Our faith and trust in God and his work needs to be grounded so much that it is, it is in our daily life a living example of God abiding in you. Jesus said in John, 17, John 7, verse 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether it speak of myself. Isaiah 1, verse 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be wool, like as wool. If you will be willing and obedient, two words, willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, four words there. Which one are we going to do? Are we going to be willing and obedient, or are we going to be refu- or are we going to refuse and rebel? It said, if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Ephesians 4, verse 13. One last verse here. Till we come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the, of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Are we reaching to the measure of the fullness of the statue of Christ? That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Don't let these strange winds of doctrine just carry you from here to there. Stay true to the word. Stay true to God. Are we teaching and following the doctrine of God or of man? As we prepare to sing our closing song, it was incorrect in the bulletin. It's actually 531. We'll build on the rock.